I, we can start with prayer. We're going to do the rosary, and I really need a rosary right now. I got into a fight with a copy machine, so. And everyone downstairs in the preschool realizes that a pastor swears now, so. So, you know when it doesn't work? No. Anyway. How about we pray the rosary together? It's the month of Mary. If you don't have a rosary, you've got a natural one that God gave you ten fingers. So, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Uh, we'll do the luminous mysteries of the rosary. I believe in God, the Father, almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. For they increase the divine virtues of faith, hope, and charity for our Holy Father Pope Francis, for Archbishop Jacobs, and all priests, for the healing of all racial divisions and hatreds in our nation. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. O oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, and lead all souls to heaven, especially those who must be needed of thy mercy. The first one in this mystery is the baptism in the Jordan. The fruit of this mystery is openness to the Holy Spirit. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. God, our Father, says to Jesus, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. O oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, and lead all souls to heaven, especially those who must be need of thy mercy. The second luminous mystery is the miracle at the wedding feast of Cana. The fruit of that mystery 
is going to Jesus through the powerful intercession of Mary. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Mary told the servants, do whatever he tells you. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, 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 Luminous mystery is the proclamation of the kingdom of God and the call to repentance. The fruit of this mystery is trust in God and conversion of life. Our Father, born in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Jesus began to preach, the time of fulfillment is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. He began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Blessed are they who are meek, they shall inherit the earth. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Blessed are the clean of heart, for they shall see God. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Blessed are you, and we exalt you and persecute you on account of me. 
Be joy simply glad for you, we will look at the gates of heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Almighty Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, and lead all souls to heaven, especially those who must in need of thy mercy. The fourth luminous mystery is the transfiguration. Uh, the fruit of this mystery is the desire for holiness. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Peter, James, and John accompanied Jesus to a high mountain. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Amen. While they were there, Jesus was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, and his face became as bright as the sun. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy And Moses and Elijah appeared with him. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. And they were conversing with Jesus about his upcoming death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God. Peter said, Lord, it is good that we are here. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But he did not know what he was saying. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us and behold, a bright cloud enveloped the three apostles, and a voice came from the cloud. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour And the voice said, This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. O my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, and lead all souls to heaven, especially those most in need of our mercy. The fifth and final luminous mystery is the institution of the Eucharist. The fruit of this mystery is adoration. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. And Jesus took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Take this all of you and eat of it, for this is my body given unto you. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our 
And he took a cup filled with wine, blessed it, and gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Amen. Take this all of you and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Do this in memory of me. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. And for us in the Oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell. Lead all souls to heaven, especially those who must do need of thy mercy. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee do we cry, O vanished children of Eve. To thee do we send up our signs, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Turn then, most gracious advocate, the eyes of mercy towards us. And after this, our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God. Let us pray, O God, whose only begotten Son, by his life, death, and resurrection, has purchased for us the rewards of eternal life. Grant, we beseech thee, that by meditating upon these mysteries of the most holy rosary of the Blessed Virgin Mary, we may imitate what they contain and obtain what they promise through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Most sacred heart of Jesus, most sacred heart of Jesus, most sacred heart of Jesus. Our Lady of the Rosary, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm glad I was late. More people could come. All right. So, uh, welcome, everybody. For those that are coming a little bit later, um, I had major technical malfunctions with the printer, and I have to go to confession now. The way I was like going at that, I think I broke it. So what's that? Oh, might be good for me to do a public confession. So I don't have enough uh, handouts, so I may have to do a little bit of sharing. Uh, I think I have enough of this one handout. Um, so let me get that out to all of you, and then we'll start. Okay? If they're married, or if you're with a couple, share there. You want to pass that one out? Everybody, Everybody gets that one. Okay. Hope everybody can hear me on the live stream. Hello, everyone. So, at least can you share it? Hopefully, you can. So. Okay. So, what I want to do is uh, if you don't know each other at your table, if you don't know each other at your table, can you introduce yourself real quick? If you don't know each other?
Okay, well, everyone introduced themselves at your table, good. So what I wanna do is, uh, the last couple of weeks has been really nice um, out in the, out with the weather, and I've been taking a couple more walks, and uh, I still have to wear black because it's slimming. Um, <laughs> thanks for laughing at my really bad jokes. Um, but I found, I took pictures of these signs that are all over the, um, the neighborhood, in Calver and Ashen, and I've seen a lot of them. So uh, let's look at them. So this first one on the top left, we believe black lives matter, no human is illegal, love is love, women's rights are human rights, science is real, water is life, injustice everywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, okay? And I've seen a couple Black Lives Matter signs. Okay, sorry. Um, I've seen a couple of those, not around our ch churches, but in Decorah, in our communities. Then these bottom two I saw, we support our law enforcement officers, and back the blue, okay? So at your table, I want you to have a little opening discussion with those questions. Okay, here are the questions. What are your initial thoughts and feelings when you see these yard signs? What are your initial thoughts and feelings when you do these yard signs? Do you think that if a person has the first two signs in their yard, that they are anti-police? Do you think if a person has the second two signs in their yard, not their year, their yard, are they racist? Do you think laws reflect morality? And lastly, What's the best way to achieve change for the better in a nation? What do you think is the best way to do that? So kind of share what your initial responses are, and uh, we'll go from there. One, two, three, go. I'll be right back, everybody. Okay, let's all come back together. Just wanted to get you kind of started to think. So what do you all think? What you guys talk about at your tables? What do you think? What are your initial thoughts and feelings when you see these yard signs? What's your gut reaction? Sad. Some say sad. Okay. Yeah. 
we're going to look at that. Okay? All right? Anybody else? Racists and divisive. Okay? Uh, so some said sad, I'm asking, feeling anybody angry when they see the signs? Some people are angry. Okay. Yeah, it's good, yeah. You know? One thing, um, does it really capture the whole reality? And, and I think that's part of the problem with a sign. It doesn't capture the whole reality, right? But it, it, it emphasizes a part of it, right? So um, one thing I want to start off with right away is I remember this old quote by an old professor I had from St. Mindred Seminary. To understand does not necessarily mean you agree. To understand does not necessarily mean you agree. So you can understand another perspective without necessarily agreeing with it. And that'll be something that you'll probably have to kind of wrestle with in our, uh, in our, uh, in our session tonight. So turn over the sheet there when we go over the, the objectives. So what I want to do is understand the church's teaching about racism. Uh, the bishops have just taught recently about it. And then um, Elsie mentioned right away uh, about this word Marxism. And um, it's being thrown a lot right now in our political discourse. Uh, people are called Marxists. Um, you hear it a lot in some of the political discourse. Well, let's actually find out what it actually means. So you can have an informed opinion. Okay, what, what does it really mean? Uh, we've heard it for a lot of years, most of the time. It's the connotation of uh, something bad and evil. Uh, if you go back to the days of the Cold War, right? Marxist communism, that's something we didn't want. There was whole foreign policy based on it. Uh, and then number two, to understand the church's teaching on solidarity. Uh, that's really the main way that the church offers for us to do good change in society, is to really believe in that word solidarity. Well, what does that word mean? We're going to look at the teaching about that. And then lastly, uh, to understand the church's teaching on the way of social change. Uh, there is a particular way of doing social change. Um, that deals with our political institutions, but also what makes up our political institutions. So that's kind of what we're going to do. Uh, and then we'll have some time for you guys to discuss it at your table. And then if it turns into a free-for-all, and I start getting tomatoes thrown at me, we'll end the session, OK? okay. Uh, I'm going to be watching Pat. She has a couple uh, tomatoes in her pocket, I think, all right? OK. So what I did here in that main packet of 10 pages is just some quotes from various church documents that are going to base on my comments there. So I'm not going to go over all of them, uh, but I'm going to refer to some of them uh, and then kind of read them and help you guys kind of reflect and maybe have a discussion. Okay, so recently, right before the pandemic uh, happened in November, November the bishops of the United States had a, their fall meeting and they approved a new pastoral letter entitled uh, Open Wide Our Hearts, a pastoral letter uh, against racism. Um, and the bishops felt the need to actually um, write about that and to bring it up again. It's uh, been taught a couple times by the U.S. bishops about racism. Uh, the main way that the U.S. bishops have taught about racism is that racism is the original sin of America. It's the original sin of America. You can go into the historical uh, details of how that happened, but ever since the beginning of our nation, we were kind of limping into our founding because of slavery, and then it all blew up at the Civil War. So the theological reflection of it is that it's always been a limp with us, you know? But then there's been this great progress since the 1960s of the Civil Rights Movement with uh, Dr. Martin Luther King leading that, and maybe we maybe finally got over it, you know, that there's sometimes a sense that we got over it. Most people aren't racists anymore. But if you look at the sociological data that the bishops um, sometimes quote in their document, it's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of like this, uh, that each generation has to commit to this teaching about rejecting the evil of racism. And for us, I think particularly, um, Maybe it makes it a little bit more uncomfortable for us. Um, how many black people do you encounter on a daily basis? I think the only African-American in Kelma moved out 
You know, there's no, I'm, I see one African American gentleman in Ashen. You know? Yeah. So there's two. <laughs> We're really diverse. You know? I mean, traditionally, I mean, it, it's been uh, the rate of, um, I think we're over 75% to 80% white. I think that's even a conservative low. Uh, so this issue, like, does it really affect us? Well, it does. If, if we take in the belief that if one part of the body suffers, everyone suffers. If one part uh, rejoices, everyone shares in their joy. So there's the sense of being connected with other people. If anyone's uh, dignity is taken away, everyone's dignity is taken away. So you can kind of see that first yard sign may, may have something to it there, you know, this dignity. So let's just kind of look at that briefly. So this is what the uh, bishops define racism as. It's right there in the bold there. Racism arises when either consciously or unconsciously a person holds that his or her own race or ethnicity is superior and therefore judges persons of other races or, or ethnicities as inferior and unworthy of equal regard. When this conviction or attitude leads individuals or groups to exclude, ridicule, mistreat, or unjustly discriminate against persons on the basis of their race or eth ethnicity, it is sinful. Ra racist acts are sinful because they violate justice. They reveal a failure to acknowledge the human dignity of the persons offended, to recognize them as neighbors Christ calls us to love. So racism occurs because a person ignores the fundamental truth that because all humans share a common origin, they are all brothers and sisters, all equally made in the image of God. When this truth is ignored, the consequences prejudice and fear of the other, and all too often hatred. Now you might say, I, I agree with that, what's the big deal? You know, I agree with that, but what's the big deal? Well, we saw that blow up over the last 10 years when we've seen, now this is where it gets kind of controversial, possibly innocent people being killed by police. A lot of it based on the, it seems that it's the preponderance of people who have black skin over white skin. That's the perception that is out there, right? And all of the policies that have happened since the 1960s to have equality among uh, races, how have those policies played themselves out? Some of them have been successful, some of them haven't. Um, some of them have uh, helped, some of them may have caused resentment. I mean, it's the it's, it's the crapshoot, you know? And then the question is, are you able to forgive? Are you able to forgive or are you able to reconcile if there's a perceived continuing discrimination against you based on your skin or, or uh, where you're from? So what the bishops are teaching is that, well, it's still somewhat present. That's what they're saying. From the collective experience of Catholics and non-Catholics throughout the United States, that there's a sense of that that we have to be sensitive to it. Uh, and sensitivity isn't a weakness, it's the opportunity to acknowledge the goodness and the inherent dignity of others. So if you go to uh, page, um, go to page, let me find my spot here. Now did I not put it on here? I was in the midst of, I was in the midst of, Oh, I didn't put it in there. Darn it. Okay, so let's look at that. I mean, geez, technology. Okay, so the, so here's one point that's really important. The cumulative effects of personal sins of racism have led to social structures of injustice and violence that makes us all accomplices in racism. Now, that's a really important point that um, I actually want to talk about. Do you think that there's any collective, I'm gonna ask this question and you can talk at your tables. Do you think that we should have any responsibility, take any responsibility for the racism that has been present in our nation? 
Do you think you have any culpability in that racism that's been present? Because if you look at that statement, the cumulative effects of personal sin of racism have led to social structures of injustice and violence that make us all accomplices in racism. So what do you think of that? So think about, if you think of our history, there was racism, there was slavery, there was discrimination, there was Jim Crow. Do you think you have any responsibility for any of that? Why don't you talk at your table? No, talk at your table. What do you think? What do you think of that statement? Read that statement and talk about it. The cumulative effects of personal sin of racism have led to social structures of injustice and violence that make us all accomplices in racism. One, two, three, go. What do you think of that? It's on page two. Okay. Okay, let's kind of come back. So what do you guys think of that sentence? I'm going to read it one more time. The, cu the cumulative effects of personal sins of racism have led to social structures of injustice and violence that makes us all accomplices in racism. What do you think of that? What do you think of that? What do you think of that? You want to agree with that? Why? Who's there? Everybody. Media. 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 Okay, what do you think? Okay. What do you think, Gary? Gary, you have your hand up. Here's the thing. Uh, let me give you an example where I think I've experienced this personally. I went to a public high school, 2,400 students. There were 656 kids in my class freshman year. And I went from an eighth grade class of 24 Catholic school students. <laughs> that was a scary bus ride, I'll tell you that. So I get to the school and go through my first year, make it through my first year, and go to my second year. And when everyone in the high school moved, it was like a, a mass of humanity, okay? So one day I was going to golf practice, and I went against uh, the flow of all the students, and I accidentally tripped um, a young uh, man, uh, and I had him, he kind of tripped, and he looked at me, and he gave me quite a look, and I recognized him, he was a well-known, that guy's a member of one of the gangs I always tried to avoid. 
So he got four of his other friends, and they literally beat the crap out of me in the corner by the payphone. They punched me in the face, black eye. It was a really kind of traumatic experience. Okay? All right. For many, many years after that, whenever I saw a black man, I tensed up a little bit. I tensed up. Why? That person probably is going to do anything to me. Why did I tense up? You know, I had a bad experience with a particular person, but those were a group of guys that I wanted to avoid. But that started to sink into my head. And then I started to look at others and like, are they going to do the same thing to me? I think if I'm really honest with myself, there's something about race inherently with that experience. There's something inherently about race. And I'm going to be suspect of somebody who does maybe the same people like that and do the same thing for me. So what I have to do is to actively go against that, to say, that is not what I'm going to assume in every person. Okay? So in a certain sense, a violent experience from a particular ethnicity deeply affected me. You know? To say that race doesn't have something with it, I don't think is too at least I'm speaking for myself, I don't think I'd be totally honest. There's something, there's something with that for me. So that's how I kind of, I mean, also another thing too, let me ask you this. Um, let's use it to another issue that's very important to a lot of people in this room. You know, abortion. Hasn't the allowing of abortion affected even us? Wouldn't you say that? It has affected us deeply. Even though we haven't done it. Maybe someone here has. God bless you. Ask for your ask for God's healing for you. But the the fact that we may not directly be involved with it does it not mean that we would also be affected by it? I think that's the point that's being made in that statement is that the cumulativeness of evil or injustice has an adverse effect on the rest of everybody even if they don't allow it, even if they don't even choose it. Okay? I think that's what the bishops are trying to get at, that there's the cumulative effects of personal sin. So I guess it's getting to the all idea that sin has a social nature to it. When you do a sin, you're hurting another person, even if you're doing a sin by yourself. You are hurting another person. There's a social aspect. I think sometimes, do we think about that? And then I, maybe I kind of think about, is that one way that confession kind of enables that? I think confession is really good. I talk about it all the time. Well, you only have to go to the priest and say, hey, I'm sorry for these sins. But the priest is also representing the church when we confess. Bless me, Father, for I've sinned. It's been 14 years since my last confession. These are my sins. You're also asking the church for for forgiveness too, not only God. Okay? So I think that's what it's kind of getting at is that the the if there's an immoral action being allowed and condoned, it has an effect on everyone. Maybe that's not the most written well, but I think that's the truth it's trying to get at. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if everyone can be racist, is it, um, or if it's a, a prevailing attitude, isn't it harder to go up the street with that? If everyone says that abortion is okay, after a while you kind of say, well, maybe it's not that bad. Okay? That's the thing. We get kind of used to the evil. We get used to it. You know? And maybe what the bishops are saying, are we letting it sneak back into our society? Are we letting it back sneak into our society? This is a question. So. Um, yeah. When you put it that way, yeah. I mean, yeah, I was not involved with it, but I feel bad that it happened to them. Yeah. I feel bad because it happened to them. Uh -huh. I don't like it. Yeah. I mean, it was affecting you. It's even though I didn't have a direct to deal with it. Mm -hmm. But it's affecting us. 
Yeah. It's like the frog in the in, in the in the pot. We don't know that the that the temperature is going up around us. So, does that make sense? So I just want to fundamentally say, racism is an act against justice because you're not acknowledging the basic dignity of the dignity of a person that another person has based on their skin color. So the one thing I didn't put in here, you can look it up online, is that then the bishops look at how racism has affected our nation, and they begin with the Native Americans. They begin with the Native Americans. The first parishioners of Festina were Native Americans. Bishop Loris used to send a priest up to this part of the area to say mass for, for those Native Americans. All of a sudden, they disappeared one day. That's because the United States government relocated them to Minnesota, so that all the hockeymans could move in. <laughs> <laughs> now here's, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Was that just? We got really nice farmland out of it, and everyone, everyone for all these 175 years have been reaping the benefit of these beautiful farmland. I mean, if you're gonna move forward with some type of feeling, don't you have to acknowledge it at one level? Something here wasn't quite right. Something here wasn't quite right, right? So I think that's what, so they go through the Native Americans, and they go through the African Americans, then they go through the Hispanics in the most recent time, some of the mistreatment that they've received, you know, in our nation. And all they're saying is that it does affect us. If we degrade other people, it eventually, it eventually degrades us. And that's why we see it as such a concern for our bishops. I think that's why they wrote a letter about it. That racism, they argue, and I agree with them. It's not because I wear the funny outfit. Uh, racism is a pro-life issue. You know, you're acknowledging the humanity of another person. So, I know all of you know that um, about uh, the belief about against racism, but sometimes it can sneak in and sneak out. You know, uh, here's a question: to Ask yourself: Did you ever have you ever participated in racial jokes? I have. That means I've participated in racism. You know, it's just acknowledging the fact of. What's your participation? It's not to make you feel bad. Oh, those people, that's the way they are. You know? Gotta be careful of that language. It's not to be oversensitive or politically correct. It's just to say, I am respecting the dignity of that other person, even if they have a messed up life. Even if they have a messed up life. You know? There's one story I want to share that will go on. I just learned this really cool story about. Pope John the 23rd, St. John the 23rd, it was referring to a priest, but it could be, uh, it could be applicable. Uh, Pope John was patriarch of Venice, and he was having a really big party, and all these hoity-toity Catholics came, and they were having a big meal and a big reception, and your eminence and your excellency and all that, and this one local parishioner in Venice had a big beef with a, with a priest. He didn't like his priest because the priest was actually kind of corrupt. He was kind of a corrupt priest. He said, what are you gonna do about that priest who's so corrupt? And Pope John took his wine glass and said, you see this wine glass? Is this my wine glass? And the layman said, yes, your eminence, this is your wine glass. He took the empty wine glass and he threw it on the ground and broke it right in front of everyone. He says, is that still my wine glass? And he said, yeah. Even if the man's broken, he's still mine. He's still my brother. He's still my brother priest. And when I read that, I'm like, whoa, I got some conversion to do here. Okay. So just wanted to highlight that. Okay, let's go to objective number. Let's uh let's uh sit at your table. What's one thing you gather from the first section of our of our presentation here? Go ahead. What's kind of sticking with you now? One, two, three, go. Talk. Talk more.
Okay, everybody, let's all come back. Okay. All right. So let's go to our next section. So Elsie uh, uh, brought up the loaded word, uh, Marxism. So she brought that up. So uh, if you go to the website for Black Lives Matter, a uh, previous um, incarnation of it, and if you do a little bit of research on it, um, they do state in several reports that the, that the organizers, there are three women who started Black Lives Matter, um, who are inspired, they say, by, by Marxism. So that's what they do say. Uh, so let's kind of look at, let's ask this question. At your table, what do you think Marxism is? One, two, three, go. What do you think it is? Okay, so what's Marxism? What do you think? Let's go around. How about the front table? What's Marxism? It's communism. What, what is communism? Okay, tell me, tell me what it, tell me, okay, all right, I'm over here. This is fun. Don't believe in God. So there's, they're atheists, okay? How about back there? Satanism on earth. Not a lot of fans here of uh, communism here, okay? How about you guys? In the middle there. Okay. All right. Social philosophy of communism. Okay. Well, if we're going to be using these words, maybe we should try to know what it means, okay? What do you think? So, um, Karl Marx, I have some basics there. Marxism 101. Okay? You can understand, but you don't have to agree. Okay? All right, so he was born um, in Germany in 1818, died in 1883. His uh, father was a rabbi. His father was a rabbi. Isn't that interesting? His father was a rabbi. Uh, then uh, he was um, a philosopher by trade. And then uh, he became very radical in his thought, and he was never going to get a job as a professor. Uh, he married um, a nice German girl, and with uh, Frederick Engels, uh, they began to publish um, publications and papers, mostly out of London. And in 1883, he died. He actually became stateless. The German Empire actually disowned him. So for the last part of his life, he had no nationality. He lived in London. Um, so he actually, he was buried in London. You can go to London to see his grave. Okay. All right, so I just want to give a little bit of an understanding of what uh, Marxism is. So number one, Marxism has a really important word with it, and that's materialism. Do you see it there, number two? Materialism. He was a student of a philosopher by the name of Hegel, okay? And Hegel was all about uh, what they call the dialectic. That there's a, a thesis and antithesis. A thesis and antithesis, and life is a continual back and forth between two opposites. And the interaction of the two opposites bring uh, a third something that actually is progress, okay? So Marx is like, that's a great idea, but it's, it's, it doesn't deal with anything spiritual. So he professes the idea of materialism, that life is only what you see and experience on this earth. Only what you, so he actually defines it there, I actually put it on there. The fact that man is a corporeal, actual, sentient, objective being with natural capacity means that he was, has actual, sensuous objects for his nature as objects of his life expression, or that he can only express his life in actual, sensuous ob ob objects. So in other words, you, he follows one of his teachers, Porterbach, you are what you eat. Ever heard of that phrase? You are what you eat. That's the basic insight of Marxism. You are what you eat. You only have this life, okay? Which then leads to that first point of atheism. He rejected religion in, 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 in all of its forms, okay? 
The third point you got to know is that if it's only about this life, then life's primary goal is economic. The value that you have in your life comes from the way you provide for your life. <coughs> so that's why for, for, um, for Marx, he looks at history through the lens of economics. Okay? So he actually abandoned philosophy and he embraced up um, economics. So when he looks at when he looks at the relationship between different groups of people, it's always based on an, an economic relationship. So he goes through history. For example, the feudal lord in relationship with his vassal, the peasant, right? You go through um, capitalism, the one who owns the factory and the workers in the factory, okay? And the relationship inherently between both of those is all of them are antagonistic. It's the assumption that everything is antagonistic between different classes of people. That inherently, people who have the means of being able to provide and be rich necessarily want to oppress other people. That was his observation about people. Okay? That a king, even though he has subjects, ultimately wants to be oppressing those that are under his rule. So whatever form of government that you have, there's always an inherent antagonism between the different classes. So if you go to the next point, it's class struggle. This is a quote by uh, Marx. The history of all hither thereto existing society is the history of class struggles. So he's the big thing of saying that the oppressed must overcome those that are oppressing them. Okay? That's the, his basic lens of looking out in the world. Right, if you keep on going then, he sees uh, reality then as two parts. So the substructure, when he looks at life, underneath everything is always something economic, right? So the feudal lord is trying to take some of the means and uh, the wealth from other people, an inherent in unequal uh, relationship. It's the capitalist taking it from the worker. There's this inherent, um, uh, economic concern that people have. In other words, it's the economy, stupid. Have you noticed how politicians always talk about the economy? Always. Are we having jobs? Are we having that, right? It's that concern about that. So for Marx, he's like, everything that is done as a nation is all done for economic reasons. War, caring for the nation, it's all based on an economic outlook. So then, on top of that then, in order to keep the oppressed oppressed, society makes a superstructure around it to reinforce the prevalent value that's going on right now. So those that are in power, those that have wealth, those that have the means of production, try to set up a culture in which everyone stays in that and it keeps going for those that have, have and those that have not continue to have not. Does that make sense? Am I speaking Greek? Let me know, okay? I haven't had philosophy in about 10 years, okay? All right? So what is the purpose then of Marxism, or what he thinks has to happen, is that the oppressed take on the means of providing for themselves. The means for providing for themselves so that everyone can equally benefit from the work of everyone. Okay? And that means inherently there must be some violent revolution in order to overcome those that are oppressed. That's kind of the basics of it, okay? Now, do we believe in injustice? We don't believe in injustice. We believe in injustice, right? But you can tell it's all trying to make things just here and now. So for a Marxist, the horizon of life is only this life. So if it's only this life, but I only have this life, I have to make this life as just as possible. It must have the most amount of justice on this side because when I die, the maggots are going to eat me. Right? I have to make my effort as much as possible. So if the state then controls the means of production, that means there can be the greatest amount of um, justice for the, for the rest of society. 
Now I can hear you all, you're all throwing darts at me right now, okay? I can feel it all right now. That is a bunch of bullcrap, Father. Okay? But what it is is inherently seeing this idea that life is unfair. Do you know we all say that to our kids? Life is unfair. And if life is unfair, there's something really wrong with that, and we gotta fix it, and we have to do any means to be willing to fix that. And the vast majority of people that are born into this world are oppressed. So I want to give you two, two quotes from Marx. Here's the first one. It's right in the middle there. You see it there? The second to last paragraph. Religious suffering is, at one and the same time, the expression of real suffering and a protest against real suffering. Religion is the sigh of the oppressed culture, the heart of a heartless world, and the soul of, a soul, of soulless conditions. It is the opium of the people. The abolition of religion as the illusionary happiness of the people is the demand for their real happiness. To call on them is to give up their illusions about their condition, is to call on them to give up a condition that requires illusions. So that's the famous uh, quote of, uh, are you guys spinning on that one? Okay. So what he's basically saying is that we're all unhappy, we are all alienated, and what we do is we have these religions that promise false happiness in order to make this life bearable. So we better make this world as, 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 as just as we can. But the, the critique is, well you better not be the oppressor because you're gonna get killed. This inherent violence that kind of happens. So do you hear that a little bit? What's going on in our nation right now? There's protesting, but there's also rioting. Right? There's a difference, right? Okay. If you're a Marxist and you want to stir up division among people, the expression of that could be violence. Right? So that's, some would argue that's where the, the Marxist influence is coming. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, let's us. Uh, I just want to do that part. You guys sit at the top of your table. What do you think of that? What do you think of that? Ever heard of it? Ever heard of it explained like that? One, two, three, go. Okay, let's all come back together. Okay, so let's kind of give it now. I kind of gave it a, an abstract uh, description of this, but here's the thing I want to give a, a real life example. Okay, so let's do the example of, uh, of uh, Russia. Okay, so Russia came under um, Lenin, who was influenced by Marx. Okay, what was going on in the society uh, before? The revolution of 1917, it was you had vast swarms of very poor Russians, okay? And you had czars, one czar whose father was attempted to be uh, assassinated because of the ferment that was going on among some of the, the, the Bolsheviks. And because of that anger, that czar turned on his country. And a lot of the country fell into famine, did not have enough food. They weren't, they weren't able to keep any of the crops that they were growing, okay? So there's already unrest and anger among, among the populace. If you throw some gasoline on top of that, 
you can see how it's kind of attractive. You know, and if it seems and the perception is, is that the church is with this czar that's doing this to me, is the church really on my side? You know? So those are those are historical factors that could that could actually lead to that, right? So if you have a person who's unjust to you, maybe you're willing to try something else in order to have maybe more justice in your life, maybe more fair fairness. I'm just kind of given that's that's a very short cliff notes of the Russian Revolution of 1917, but that's some of the factors that went on to actually becoming the Soviet Union. Okay. All right, let's say, let's go to our third part. How would you respond if you're a Catholic? How is society supposed to be uh, ordered, right? I mean, if you look at the Catholic Church and its relationship with governments, it's been in relationship with a lot of different types of government, right? I mean, for a while, there were a lot of kings ruled in Europe. You guys want to go back to having a king? Well, what if it was a saint and it was, what if it was Saint Louis the Ninth of France? Or was Saint Wenceslas, he was a king. Do you want to go back to his rule? Who wants to go back to, I kind of like the state opening of Parliament. It's a little bit of pomp and circumstance, put a crown on your head, wear funny outfits. What do you think of that? It's not partisan. The head of state you wouldn't have to elect. Everyone could like the queen, whether if you were a labor or conservative. What do you think? Well, if you were lucky, you could have a good person that way. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe it's just as good as who we're voting for. What do you think? <laughs> right? The person. Is good. Oh. Yeah, but here's the question though you're in the wrong organization because the Pope runs everything. <laughs> I mean, it's really kind of a monarchy. I mean, he's the, isn't that kind of funny? Yeah, I would hope it would be. Yeah. Sometimes there weren't, though. Like Pope Alexander VII, if you go to St. Peter's Basilica, he has this beautiful Bernini marble statue, and he fathered seven kids as the Holy Father. <laughs> what is going on here? Right? So there, that's proof that the church is divine. Okay? All right. So let's just go to our third thing. So what? how should society be ordered? Well, the church does not have an official statement or teaching about, like, there are legitimate monarchies in the world today still. There, there, are, there are legitimate, okay? But the vast majority of our governments, other than those that are run by dictators, is, is democracy, okay? But the main point that the church has, and if you go to page three of your handout, if you go to page three of your handout, okay? Okay, you guys are like my seventh graders. Okay, be quiet. No, I'm <laughs> just joking. Okay. All right, page three, 1878. All men are called to the same end, God himself. There's a certain resemblance between the union of the divine persons and the fraternity that men are to establish among themselves in truth and love. Love of neighbor is inseparable from love for God. The human person needs to live in society. Society is not for him an extraneous addition, but a requirement of his nature. Through the exchange with others, mutual service, and dialogue with his brethren, man develops his potential. He thus responds to his vocation. So the number one principle of any type of organization is, is the human person. The human person is the most important person in society, the individual. The individual who is an unrepeatable miracle of God. That's what, that's what society is actually based on. And then what comes from, out of that? The family. What comes out of that? A larger Christian community. What comes out of that? A state. What comes out of that? A nation. It's all based on having the human person be the center 
of society. Because God made us for our own purpose, so that we could be with God for all eternity. So right away, if you look at 1878, all men are called to the same end, God himself. Do you think Karl Marx would agree with that? So fundamentally, we are different. It's a different horizon. We're meant for God, and by being meant for God, we're meant to be brought to other people. Right? Just haven't we learned that from the pandemic? Right? How people are wasting away in isolation from one another. Right? If any time in our history that we can understand that, it's right now. Okay? So that's the first point when it comes to organizing anything, is the dignity of the human person being, being taken care of by the community that you're a part of. That's the primary concern of a government. That's the primary concern of any community. That's the primary concern of a family. That's the primary concern of you. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do you love yourself? You know, it all goes to that. The centrality of the human person, okay? All right. If you want to switch over then, we go to page 4, 1886. Go to page 4, 1886. Do you not have one, guys? We're sharing. We're sharing. Oh, okay. All right. 1886. Okay, here's, um, here's the point here then. Society is essential to the fulfillment of the human vocation. To attain this aim, respect must be accorded to the just hierarchy of values, which subordinates physical and instinctual dimensions to the interior and spiritual ones. So let her do this quote. Human society must primarily be considered something pertaining to the spiritual. Through it, in the bright light of truth, men should share their knowledge, be able to exercise their rights and fulfill their obligations, be inspired to seek spiritual values, mutually derive genuine pleasure from the beautiful, of what order it be, always be readily disposed to pass on to others the best of their own cultural heritage. And where's page five? Strive to make their own spiritual achievements of others. These benefits not only influence, but at the same time give aim and scope to all that has bearing on cultural expressions, economic and social institutions, political movements and forms, laws, and all other structures by which society is outwardly established and constantly developed. You might be thinking, Father, this is way too late for that. Right? What, it, what it is is the first step in making a better society is our own conversion. The first step of making a better society is our own conversion. So I, like, I love asking this question to engage couples. What are you going to pass on from your family that's good and beautiful to your children? And what are you going to stop passing on to your children because it's horrible from your family? You know? That's how you make a better world. Is first you, right? What's the saying of Jesus? If you have a speck in your eye, take it out before you take the log in the other, right? Is looking at yourself first. If you point at somebody, how many fingers are pointing back at you? Three. So you better look at yourself, buddy. So every time you're doing this, you're looking at yourself three times. You know? So that's the first step of actually becoming a better society is, is by looking at ourselves. Okay? Uh, if you go to page six then, go at the bottom of the page there, page six, the common good. I'm going to ask this question you ask at your, uh, at your table. What does that mean, the common good? But don't look at the paragraph. Before you look at it, what's the common good? One, two, three, go. The common good. You're going to hear that a bunch in Catholic teaching, the common good. <laughs> okay, what's the common good? What's the common good? If you had to explain it to a seventh grader like me tomorrow, what would you say? What's the common good? What do 
you want to say, if there's a Ronnie, are you volunteering somebody? <laughs> he's, reading, he's reading the paragraph. What do you think here? What's the common good? What do you think here? Something good for everyone. It benefits everyone. Good for all. And can we disagree on that? On what's good for all? Yeah. Welcome to politics. <laughs> Ultimately, it's supposed to be about disagreeing and trying to find the common good for all. Okay, let's look at the definition of the common good. Because that language has been totally lost in our, in our political discourse, unfortunately. So look at 1906. By common good is to be understood the sum total of social conditions which allow people, either as groups or as individuals, to reach their fulfillment more fully and more easily. The common good concerns the life of all. It calls for prudence from each, and even more from those who exercise the office of authority. It consists of three essential elements. We won't go into that, but uh, you can read that when you go home and you fall asleep to the Catechism of the Catholic Church. That's supposed to be a joke. Thanks for laughing. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so you can see it's the mirror of that comment earlier by the bishops. Do you know that comment, the cumulative effect of um, personal sin leads to the, us being an, an accomplice of sin for everyone, right? The common good is the exact opposite of that. If everyone pursues the good, everyone becomes better. The goodness of other people affects your goodness. So in a society, that's why you kind of want that. So for example, I'll give you, a, I'll give you an example. Um, do you know that the church's official teaching is that governments should for, for, forbid and not allow vulgar media? That's actually the official teaching of the church. That a government, in trying to ensure the common good, should not allow things like pornography in the world. That there should be the force of law that that should not be allowed. But our American sensibility is like, you should be able to do whatever you want, right? You can't do that. It's freedom of expression, right? But that freedom of expression is actually allowing for a, a common good sometimes. So that's just one example where the church teaching and our values kind of, kind of rub up against each other, okay? All right, here's the last thing I want to go over, and then I'll call it good. I actually need to hang out. I'm so sorry. God bless you. The last thing I want to talk about is solidarity then. If you go to page 10, go on the back. Okay, the principle of solidarity, this is what it means. The principle of solidarity also articulated in terms of friendship or social charity is a direct demand of human and Christian brotherhood. So 1940, solidarity is manifested in the first place by the distribution of goods and, re, and, re, and re, remuneration for work. It also presupposes the effort for a more just social order where tensions are better able to be reduced and conflicts more readily settled by negotiation. So solidarity is the idea that I am a brother to each person that I encounter. Even the person that sent a vote for the other party, that they're my brother, they're my fellow citizen. I disagree with them. Do you know what? I'm going to sit down and I'm still going to have a beer with them. I'm still going to try to have bonds of friendship with other people. You know? That's what's so disturbing about the present political culture is that you destroy your opponent. Did you know back in the 80s there was a stand up pickup uh, basketball game? for the members of Congress at you every day. Do you, do you know that doesn't happen anymore? You know, they don't even talk to one another, right? So there's a loss of solidarity and friendship, okay? Want to go to that. Last thing I want to do, and then I'll let you go, and we can have some questions if you want, is get the sheet that you had about Marxism out. Turn it on the other side. What's the Christian response to Marxism then? So I just want to show you the principles of Martin Luther King. Okay? This is what he did. And it gets to the principles of nonviolence. Can we make and solve our problems without going to violence? So here's his principle.
principles that he lived by. Number one, nonviolence is a way of life for courageous people. It is active nonviolence, resistance to evil, be it aggressively, spiritually, mentally, and emotionally. Now, principle two, nonviolence seeks to win friendship and understanding. The end result of nonviolence is redemption and reconciliation. The purpose of nonviolence is the creation of the beloved community, where even enemies become friends. Number three, nonviolence seeks to defeat injustice, not people. Nonviolence recognizes that evildoers are also victims and are not evil people. The nonviolent resistor seeks to defeat evil, not people. That would help that a lot of people could follow that one. Like I had, I had a conversion with that. You know, the person who promotes something that I, I vehemently am against abortion, is that person evil in themselves? I have to say no. God made them good. They have a really erroneous opinion, but they're a person I have to love, not hate. Okay? Principle four, nonviolence holds that suffering can educate and transform. Nonviolence accepts suffering without retaliation. Unearned suffering is redemptive and has tremendous educational and transforming possibilities. What do you think about that? Getting berated for something holy that's right. Principle five, nonviolence chooses love instead of hate. Nonviolence resists violence of the spirit as well as the body. Nonviolent love is spontaneous, unmotivated, unselfish, and creative. Then lastly, nonviolent believes that the universe is on the side of justice. The nonviolent resistor has deep faith that justice will eventually win. Nonviolence believes that God is a God of justice. So I found that really interesting. Uh, what are any of those principles that you need in your life right now? You know, I wonder if number three needs to happen more in our, in, in, in our nation right now. But just because you disagree with somebody doesn't mean that that person is evil. Okay. I, um, if you want to have something really interesting to read, and it's not that long, um, and would deal directly with the way our world is right now, I would read the second inaugural address of Abraham Lincoln. If you, if you get a chance, 1865, it's on, it's, on, it's on the internet. And what he talks about is the healing of the nation after killing each other for over hundreds of thousands of people. He says, we must not lose the fact that we are fellow citizens. And um, I think that message actually needs to be heard as well today. So, all right, um, why don't you go around the table? What's one thing you've taken away from this session? And then I'll let you go. So it's 7.45. He chose the better part. Okay, you can stay after and talk a little more, but does anyone want to share what they, what's the one thing they're taking away? Anybody? Okay. Yeah, act like Gordon King, not like Karl Marx. Well, I'll be honest, I, I wish uh, this presentation would have gone better. I was really flustered with that technology. You know how it is when you get flustered. So, uh, hope it was helpful to you. 
wanted to take a, a Catholic take on uh, the Black Lives Matter, kind of help you understand some of the ideas that are going into it. And if you have any more questions, I'll stick around after. And if not, uh, I won't be uh, offended. Yeah, Jean. This is not a major tonight, but uh, Monday, the polls open at least in Brooklyn, or about mm -hmm. in Brooklyn, the polls. And um, my brother went, and he was talking to him tonight. He said, Be sure you know who you want to vote for when you go to the polls this year, because they are not marked Republican, Democrat. Because a lot of people go by, oh, that name sounds good, or that name, because you hear it in the media. Know who you want to vote for, because they aren't marked. Okay, anybody else? Any last takes? Very small letters. Okay, let's uh, end by, uh, how about we pray? Hail Mary for our nation. In the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and that. We pray together. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Thanks for putting up with me. God bless you.